Hello and welcome to Marxism Today. I'm Red Wagner and I'll be your host. Today's episode is Theories of Value. One of the core questions of any economic theory is where does value come from? For a long time there was agreement on this topic. The value of commodities came from the human labor put into them. This theory only became challenged after Marx used it in possibly his most important work, Capital. Marx decided to agree with the labor theory of value. In fact, he took for granted most of the capitalist economic thinking at the time. I think it's good to remember that the labor theory of value didn't come from Marx. It came from people who supported capitalism. But why do people who support capitalism today now reject the labor theory of value? Because Marx used it in his theories. In Capital, Marx doesn't spend much time critiquing the ideas of pro-capitalist economists. Instead, he pushes forward the analysis. He looks deeper into the issues at hand. Marx's use of the theory goes something like this. We all agree that human labor creates value. And at the time, economists did agree on that. So, continues Marx, it must be the workers who have made the value in each business. Sure, some of the owners do work, and that work can create value, but certainly the vast majority of work is done by workers, and there are, of course, bosses who do no labor at all. A modern example of this would be the major stockholders of companies, a small group of people who own so much stock that they are essentially an owner of the company. These owners need not ever visit the workplace or talk to anyone in it. Since work creates value... The workers are the ones making the value, but they only receive a portion of the value created by them. This is what Marx calls exploitation. Workers go to work and receive wages for their work, so they are paid a portion of the value they create, but they make value above and beyond what they are paid, because otherwise the capitalist has no incentive to hire them. Since pro-capitalists couldn't argue with Marx's logic here, they had to attack his premise. Value does not come from labor anymore. Now it comes from desire. The shift of viewing value as coming from labor to viewing value as coming from desire was necessary for economic thinkers to be able to reject Marx. If value no longer comes from labor, then capitalist economists hope that maybe exploitation doesn't actually exist. As a Marxist, I believe the stance of capitalist economists to be rather disingenuous and purely politically motivated. But regardless, let's take a look at the two theories. My stance is going to be a little different than what you might hear from other Marxists. First, I'm going to say that both theories are correct to a greater or lesser extent. Clearly, human labor can create value. That's why jobs exist. If human labor didn't create value, there would be no reason for anyone to hire someone else. Also clear is that human desire must play a role in value. If nobody wants something, then it doesn't matter how long you've spent working on it, it still has no value. Let's take a look at the two theories. First, the labor theory of value. Before marginal utility became a theory, the labor theory recognized that labor must be socially useful or socially necessary. This is a part of the theory that basically said, if you labor all day long making something that nobody wants, then the labor doesn't really create value. For example, if I just blindly banged on my keyboard, randomly hitting keys, and then published the result as a book, no one would buy it. This is because my labor was not socially useful or socially necessary. What if I take two weeks to knit a sweater by hand? If most sweaters are made by people using machines in factories and they can make them in five minutes, then my weeks of labor may only be worth five minutes of labor since that's the normal amount. Using the idea of socially necessary labor, we can see that desires play a a part in the labor theory of value. It's already part of the theory. Now, in marginal utility theory, we begin by looking at desires. Marginal utility theory explains why, if I'm a baker, I'll trade bread for shoes. 
I have plenty of bread because I'm a baker, but I need a pair of shoes, so let's trade. The bread has very little value to me, while the shoes have more. The same is true in opposite for the shoemaker. Perhaps he's hungry for bread, but he certainly doesn't need any more shoes, so he trades. Marginal utility theory tries to look only at exchange, but behind every exchange is production. If we really want to understand in totality, we must look there as well. If it didn't take any human labor to make bread, it wouldn't be worth very much. If anyone could just have bread by thinking it into existence or wishing for it, then no matter what my desire for it, it would have no value on the open market. The same is true for air. Since we all need air, our desire for it should be very high. But because it is abundant and requires no human labor to obtain, we won't pay anything for it. But what about the things we spend time thinking about, desiring? When using marginal utility theory, we must acknowledge that human labor can create the things we desire. Perhaps I want a widescreen TV. If I'm going to be honest, then I must acknowledge the fact that the labor of a large number of people goes into the creation of that TV. The labor theory puts human creativity and labor power at the center and then later states that it must be socially necessary labor. While marginal utility looks first at human desire and then tries to ignore production, which leads it to being a narrow and incomplete theory. It attempts to dispel exploitation by not looking at production, but it cannot deny that human labor has the ability to create value and that in fact that is the basis of every job, that the worker will in some way create value. At the same time, I cannot say that marginal utility theory is wrong. It is true that for an item to have market value, people must desire it. People must find more utility in that object than the others they could buy with their cash. The theory is not flawed because the things it says are wrong. The theory is simply incomplete. It attempts to make every social interaction the peculiar experience of one or two individuals without ever looking at the big picture. Marginal utility might explain why I ordered an omelet and not pancakes. Because I found more quote-unquote utility in an omelet. In other words, I just wanted it more. But my lack of desire for pancakes doesn't lower the price. No matter how much I despise pancakes, the price on the menu is going to stay the same. Using labor theory, we can see the omelet and pancakes both have value because both require human labor to cook the food, ship the ingredients, raise the chickens, grow the grain, and on and on. The required labor put into these items is going to be a more useful explanation of their value than my individual desires. Again, marginal utility theory does not make an error except for the error of omission. It is true that desire plays a role in value. If nobody wants something, there is no value to be had, no matter how much labor went into it. The only way we can understand exchange values in totality is with the labor theory of value. If you want to analyze why you bought one thing over another, then perhaps marginal utility theory works best. But if you want to see the big picture, to look at the world as a large integrated system to understand how global forces work for and against each other, then we must turn to the labor theory of value. This has been Theories of Value, and I'm Red Wagner. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.